the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Sometimes when we read a passage like this, and then if we continue through the book of Ecclesiastes, we can get lost in all the details. And that statement that we saw over in chapter 12 about how the collected sayings are nails firmly fixed. I think what Solomon is saying there is, I have given you a guide for understanding my book. You need to find these repeated, firmly fixed nails, and they will function like interpretive guides for you. So I want to suggest to you that the first of these comes in chapter 1, verse 3, when Solomon asks the question, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? And I would invite you to look over at chapter 3, where in verse 9, he asks the same question. What gain has the worker from his toil? And I think the ESV has correctly indicated that what starts in verse 9 really continues through verse 15, and then there's a new departure, a new idea that is taken up at chapter 3, verse 16. So I want to suggest that 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 question that's asked at 1-3 and repeated at 3-9 really controls the whole of 1-1 through 3-15. So if we want to have have a a way of summarizing chapter 1, verse 1 through 3-15, I think it's that question at 1-3 and 3-9, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? And we've essentially seen the answer in the previous lecture. He gains the opportunity to eat and drink and see good in his toil. We'll come back and consider more about uh, that that first section in just a moment. Let me walk you through the rest of the book and, and suggest what I think are the big ideas through the rest of the book. So look with me, if you will, at chapter 3, verse 16. Here Solomon says, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. And, and, and so what he's, what he's taking up here at 316 is the topic of injustice. And he's going to address this topic of injustice repeatedly from 316 to 612. So that's the next unit. The first unit is 1-1 to 315. And the question is, what do you gain from your toil? The next unit is 316 through 612, and the issue is where there's supposed to be righteousness, there's justice. Uh, there, sorry, where there's supposed to be righteousness, there's injustice. So look at 4.1. He says, again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And he's going to contemplate oppression. And then if you look at chapter 5, verse 8, we see, if you see in, the, in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness... So he's repeatedly dealing with this theme of of injustice and unrighteousness and and the resulting oppression. Now, I think he provides a very clear response to injustice and oppression, and I just want to briefly anticipate it before we go on to the next section. So look back at chapter 3, verse 17, 
where he says, right after introducing this idea of where there's supposed to be righteousness, there's wickedness, and where there's supposed to be justice, there's injustice, he says in 317, I said in my heart, God will judge the unrighteous and the wicked. So that's his response. God will judge them. And that's what comforts him. The, the, the confidence, the knowledge that God is going to set all things right at the final judgment. So he's really contemplating the end of all things there. Now look at how this section ends over in chapter 6, verse 12. Look at the last words of verse 12. Well, let's read the whole of verse 12. Who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? So the first section, 1 1 through 3 15, what do you gain from all your toil? We'll consider more about what he says there in just a moment. The second section, how do you respond when you see injustice? And I think his response is, you need to recognize that God is going to set all things right at the final judgment. This next section is going to start in chapter 7 and continue through the end of chapter 8. So 7-1 through 8-17. And I think the theme here, the, 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 the big idea is, is the one that is repeatedly stated throughout this section. And, and the first instance of it is in chapter 7, verse 14, where Solomon says, in the day of prosperity, be joyful, and in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. And I think what he's communicating is you don't know what the future holds and you won't be able to find out what will be after you. And so we'll see this idea again in chapter 7, verse 24, where he says, that which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? So this, this question, who can find it out, echoes so that man may not find out. And then this word find occurs seven times in chapter 7, verses 25 through 29. Over and over again, Solomon is going to refer to what can be found or what he found or what he didn't find. Repeatedly, he states this. And then he gets to the end of this unit of text. And in chapter 8, verse, 16, verse 17, he says, Then I saw all the work of God, that man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. So this idea of, of what man cannot find out, what man will not be able to find out, that's really the theme of chapter 7 and 8. Uh, the next unit begins in chapter 9, and it's going to continue through chapter 11, verse 6. And the theme of this unit is what man cannot know, what man does not know. And so, um, if you look at chapter 9, verse 1, we read here, all this I laid to heart, examining it all, how the righteous and the wise and their deeds are in, in the hand of God, whether it is love or hate, man does not know. Both are before him. And then look at chapter 9, verse 12. For man does not know his time, like fish that are taken in an evil net, like birds that are caught in a snare. So the children of man are snared at an evil time when it suddenly falls upon, him, upon them. And then a moment ago, we saw that in 8.17, this, this he will not find out or he cannot find out idea is repeated three times. The same thing happens in chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, this idea that man does not know. So if you look at 11.5, he says, as you do not know, that's the first instance, the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child. Now, now contemplate that. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived this side of the Lord Jesus, is essentially saying, we don't know how life comes to the baby in the womb. We don't know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child. We don't know. There are mysteries to life that we cannot, we cannot explain. 
As you don't know that, so, he continues, you do not know the work of God who makes everything. He's saying there are mysteries in creation that you will not get to the bottom of. So in response to this, verse 6, in the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that. So this idea of, of the limits of human knowledge, I think, is the theme of uh, starting in, in 9.1 and continuing to 11.6. And that brings us to the final section of the book, which I think starts in 11.7 and continues through 12.14. And the, the idea here is fear God and keep his commandments because you're going to enter into judgment. And you can see this in, in 11.9 at the end of the verse, know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. And then you see it again in 12.14, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, when I was here last year, I sought to explain that the gospel of John is chiastically structured. And um, uh, in, a, in a chiasm, it's almost like a pyramid. And, and the first part matches the last part, the second part matches the second to last, the third, the third to last, and then there's a central piece. Here again, I think the book of Ecclesiastes is chiastically structured. So that the first section, 1-1 one, one through 3-15, what does man gain from his toil, matches the last section, 11-7 through 12-14, know that for all these things you'll be brought into judgment. And, and again, it's that judgment that makes it where we're not, we're not eating and drinking and being merry for tomorrow we die. We're eating and drinking, receiving God's gifts to us, and we're trying to find good in our toil, see good in our work. We're trying to enjoy our work and the fruits of it, but doing so in a way that we know we're going to come into judgment. Okay, so uh, what, what does man gain? Know that for all these things you'll come into judgment. The second section, 316 through 612 injustice in the world. Well, what does Solomon say in that second to last section? That's the part with the refrain, man does not know. And I, I think he's, he's teaching us wisdom. He's teaching us, when you see injustice, don't jump to conclusions. Don't think that you, if you were put in authority, if you were put in power, there wouldn't be injustice. Don't think that you'd be able to fix it. Don't think you can fix it. You have to trust God. Man does not know. There's injustice in the world. You don't know everything God is up to, even through the injust un injustice. So you have to trust him. And then that third section um, is, is the, the part where he comes and he says, and, and in this case, this is the central section, that, that central section of the book. And this is where he says, you cannot find it out. You cannot find it out. So Solomon, the wisest of men, is urging his audience to humility. And, and what I want to do in, in the remainder of, of this session with you is look more closely at that first unit, 1-1 one, one through 315, and, and I want to just try to trace the contours of Solomon's thought in this unit because I think what he does here is so profound and so significant for our understanding. So a moment ago, I read 1, 1 through 11, and, and I just want to briefly comment on what he's doing there. N notice how in verses 4 through 7, he's speaking of the generations coming and going in verse uh, verse 4, verse 5, the sun rises and sets. Verse 6, the wind blows to the south. And then verse 7, all the streams run to the sea. A lot of this pertains to creation and the inhabitants of the world. And I think what he's saying is the pattern of creation is set. And he's, he's about to say there's nothing new under the sun. And I think the kind of thing he's getting at is there's not a human being who's going to be able to say, I think we're going to make the, the sun, uh, or we're going to make the earth rotate the other way around the sun. Or I think I'd like for the sun to go on this, or the earth, really, to go on this different track so that actually the, 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 the atmosphere is altogether different, the seasons are altogether, no, we can't do that, can we? We cannot alter the fixed order of creation. And then, starting in verse 8, it's as though he turns from creation and the fixed order of creation to human experience. And he gets at the way that, that all things are full of weariness. 
a man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing. The ear is not filled with hearing. And, and this is the quality of our experience, isn't it? We've never seen enough. We hear these songs and we want to hear them again. And then having heard that song repeatedly, we want to hear something fresh. We're never satisfied in, in this life. This, he's getting at the human condition. And then he speaks of how there's nothing new under the sun and, and there's no remembrance of the things past. At the end of this, in, in the final section of, of chapter one, look at what he says in chapter one, verse 15. What is crooked cannot be made straight and what is lacking cannot be counted. I think what he's getting at is the way that once Adam sinned and was driven out of the Garden of Eden, there are things about us as human beings and there are things about the world that have been bent and now that that thing has been bent, it cannot be made straight. We cannot put things right and there are things lacking in our experience that we cannot even begin to enumerate. We know, we have this sense, something is missing here. Something is wrong. Something is not right, but we can't supply it. We can't even enumerate it. We can't put our finger on it. We can't straighten it out. This is a broken and fallen world. That, that, that I think is the big idea that Solomon is communicating here. So all through chapter one, what he's dealing with is the fixed order of creation, the nature of human experience, and life outside Eden. Now in chapter two, I wanna to suggest to you what Solomon set out to do, the great task that he undertook, what he sought to achieve. And, and here's, here's, here's the bottom line. I think that Solomon understood that as the son of David, as the king of Israel, he was the leader of God's people. He was the representative of God on earth. And as such, Adam's job, the, the first man, the, the task that God gave to him was Solomon's job. Adam's job was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and have dominion and subdue the world. And I think Solomon understands that's my job. And so look at how he describes his work starting in chapter two, verse four. He says, I made great works. I built houses, and we know that one of the houses that he built was the temple, and another house that he built was his own house. And I don't really have time to go into it here, but I, I wanna say that the temple is like a small-scale replica of the cosmos. So in building the temple, it's as though Solomon is building, building a small portrait of the world. So he says, I built houses, and then he says, uh, there in, in verse Four, I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks. Now, a lot of this language, the language for gardens and the language for planted is the exact same phraseology seen in Genesis 2, verses 8 through 10, where the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And, and in that Eden that God planted, what, what he had was an enclosed paradise. The, the, our word paradise is actually, uh, the English word paradise is just a, a bringing into English of the word that's translated parks here. Solomon is essentially saying, I made enclosed paradises. And then look what, it, what he goes on to say. Verse six, or sorry, verse five, I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. And you can go back and look at Genesis two and God causes all these trees to spring up from the ground. Trees that are beautiful to look at and good for food. And then the text tells us the tree of life was there and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then he says there in verse six, I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. And in Genesis chapter two, verse 10, we read about the, the rivers that flowed through Eden to water the garden. So 
We could go on through this text. I, I don't really have time to, so I'm going I'm to I'm I'm stop here. But if, if you want more on this, you can go to kenwoodbaptistchurch.com and find the sermons that I'm preaching on Ecclesiastes right now. Here's the bottom line. It's as though Solomon is saying, I tried to rebuild the Garden of Eden. I recognized that because of Adam's sin, man had been cast out of God's presence, driven out of the clean realm of life in the Garden of Eden, and I tried to recreate it. And this, I think, is why he says in chapter 2, verse 11, I can't, I can't pass over chapter 2, verse 10. Look at, look at chapter 2, verse 10. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I don't think that's a sinful statement. I think he's saying, I wanted to see good in my work in the same way that God saw good in his work. And then he goes on, I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. This is what he's going to do, commend as good all through the book, to find pleasure in the work that God gives you to do. And Solomon, as the new Adam has taken up the task of rebuilding the Garden of Eden, and he's enjoying it. It's a great undertaking. It requires all of his intelligence, all of his skill, all of his resources, and, and he's exhilarated by the task. And he says, and this was my reward for all my toil. His reward for the toil was the pleasure that he found in doing it. Because, look at verse 11, then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil that I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was breath and a striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained. Remember that question at 1-3? What does man gain? Now he's saying, I gave it everything that I had. And there was no one wealthier than me. There was no one with more power at his disposal than me. There was no one wiser than me. I gave it everything, and there was nothing to be gained. I don't think he means it's altogether pointless and meaningless and now I'm a cynical skeptical and I'm giving up on life. No, I don't think that's what he means at all. I think what he means is I'm not sufficient to take us back into God's presence. Essentially, I think what he's saying is I realized that I'm not the new Adam. I'm not the anointed king of Israel, the Messiah who is going to make it so that man can re-enter God's presence in the garden of life. Now, I think Solomon believes that a son of David is going to bring that about, and he sets out to accomplish the, the task, and he can't do it. In this next unit, uh, starting in verse 12, so it's as though he's undertaken the great task, the Adamic task, to rebuild the garden of Eden, and he can't bring it about. And then look, at, look with me at, Chapter 2, verse 12, he says, So I turn to consider wisdom and madness and folly, for what can man do? What can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Now let's just consider what he's saying here for a moment. He's just said in 2.11, there was nothing to be gained under the sun. But now he's coming back and saying, there is more gain in wisdom than in folly. So he's, it's like he's, he's balancing his statements. There's nothing to be gained in the sense that I can't bring about salvation for all people, but there is gain in wisdom. And there's more gain in wisdom than in folly. Verse 14 of chapter two, the wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceived that the same event happens to all of them. Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come, all will have been long forgotten how the wise dies just like the fool. That's the event that happens to all. All die. So here's what I would propose to you, Solomon is saying in 2, 1 through 11. I tried to rebuild the Garden of Eden and I couldn't get it done. It was all, it was all breath. 2, 12 through 17, I think he's saying, I turned to consider death and I saw that I could not overcome death. I'm going to die. I cannot 
resurrect myself from the grave and give myself eternal life. And then in the next section, 2.18 through 23, he says in verse 18, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun. Now, I think we should understand this in context. I don't th- he's going to repeatedly urge people to see good in their toil and to enjoy their toil. So why, does, why is he saying here that he hates his toil? I want to suggest that he hates it because of what sin and death have done to them. He hates his toil because he realizes, I can't accomplish everything that I would like to accomplish. So it's because of sin and death that he hates his toil. The toil is good. The doing of the toil gave him pleasure, but because he's going to die, and because he's a sinner, and the world is bent and can't be made straight, this is why he hates his toil. He hates what sin and death have done to his toil. And also, he goes on to say in 2.18, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. The man who came after Solomon was named Rehoboam. And they came to to Rehoboam and they said, "Uh, your father has made our yoke heavy. Lighten the yoke from upon us. And Rehoboam answered the people foolishly, He said, my little finger is thicker than my father's loins. And and he sent the people away harshly. And the people said, what portion do we have in the house of David? To your tents, O Israel. And the northern kingdom split from the southern kingdom and was broken in two. And it was never put back together through all the history of Israel. I think Solomon could see what kind of man Rehoboam was. I think Solomon could see the man who's coming after me to be king over Israel is a fool. And he's such a fool that he's probably going to split the kingdom in half. And, and I th- you know, you read the book of Proverbs, and, and it's as though you're hearing this desperate appeal from a father. Hear my son and receive my teaching. It's like he's pleading with Rehoboam. Won't you become a wise man? Make my heart glad. Don't be a fool. And Rehoboam just won't listen. And here, I think in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 18 through 23, it's as though Solomon is, is looking at Rehoboam and saying, I can't make that man wise. I cannot guarantee that he will be wise. And as a result, at the end of chapter 2, verse 23, this also is breath or vanity. Now, let's just put together these statements. Solomon is found. He can't rebuild Eden. He can't overcome death, and he can't give wisdom. I'm going to put this another way. He can't create the new heavens and new earth. He can't resurrect the body and grant everlasting life, and he can't elect unto righteousness. He does not have the ability to do these things, but I think that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to bring about salvation. He's trying to bring about the new heavens and the new earth. And he's recognizing, I'm insufficient for this task. And implicitly saying, there's going to have to be one greater than me come around to accomplish this. And you remember what the Lord Jesus said. He said to his contemporaries who were rejecting his teaching, he said, the queen of Sheba will rise up in the judgment and condemn this generation. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And one greater than Solomon is here. That's what the Lord Jesus said. Well, then we've already looked at chapter 2, verses 23 through 26. Or sorry, 24 through 26, where he, he communicates this positive conclusion. And, and it's as though he's saying to us, you're not going to be able to do it either. You can't make the Garden of Eden. You can't resurrect the dead and give them ever, everlasting life. You can't elect unto salvation and give wisdom to those whom you have decreed will receive eternal life. You can't do that either. What can you do? You can eat and drink and see good in your toil. You can be satisfied with doing a good job at what God has given you to do and working unto him. And then, as if he is becoming reconciled to what God has given to man, we have this glorious poem in 3, 1 through 8, 
where he speaks of how there's a time for everything. And, and I'm not going to read through this. I, I trust you've probably read this many times in your life. I want to skip down to 3.9, where he returns to that question that he started with in 1.3. Chapter 1, verse 3, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? Chapter 3, verse 9, what gain has the worker from his toil? And then he says, I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. And I, I would just observe that he's spoken very similarly chapter, in chapter 1, verse 13, where he says, it is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. It's a very similar phrase. So what he's doing is, it's like he's tying off this section by repeating statements from the beginning of it. I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He, God, has made everything beautiful in its time. It's as though Solomon is saying, what I have is beautiful. The building of the temple is beautiful. It's not the Garden of Eden. I tried to make it that, but it's not. But it, it's beautiful in its time. And when Christ comes, what he will accomplish will be beautiful in its time. Also, verse 11 there, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out, anticipating that later section where he'll repeat that phrase, what God has done from the beginning to the end. So we have, we have eternity in our hearts. We all know, we have this sense, we were made for a better world. We were made for a world where children don't die. We were made for a world where we don't need locks on our doors. We were made for a world where we don't need weapons. We were made for a world in which all are upright and pure, the Garden of Eden. And, and we anticipate a day when Christ will come and renew all things and make the world like that. C.S. Lewis famously said, if I find in myself a longing which nothing in this world can satisfy, I know that I was made for a better world. And that, that's, that's something like what Solomon is saying here, that God has put eternity into our hearts yet so that we cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. And then he repeats that, that conclusion again there in 3.12, nothing better than to be joyful, to do good, also that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Verse 14, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. I think he's alluding to the way that the sun rises and sets and the winds blow on their courses, and the streams run to the sea, and the generations come and the generations go. God has set these things in motion. Whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done it, look at the last words of verse 14, so that people fear before him. This book is not just saying fear God and keep his commandments at the end. All through the book, Solomon is saying, Fear God. Look at creation, look at the limits of what you can accomplish, and fear God. And then verse 15 is again going to restate things that we saw in chapter 1. Chapter 1, that which has been is that which will be, and so forth. 3.15, that which is already has been. And that which is to be already has been. And God seeks what has been driven away. Now that last line, God seeks what has been driven away, I think alludes to the way that God drove the man out of the Garden of Eden. And I think Solomon is saying something like, I tried to rebuild Eden. I tried to bring all God's children home. I couldn't do it, but God is gonna do it. God is seeking those who have been driven away. God is seeking those who maybe are making an idol of their work. If, if you're looking at your life's achievements and you're saying this is where I'm going to find significance and meaning and purpose and fulfillment, you should ask yourself, is my work a God to me? If you're looking to somehow establish your identity through your accomplishments, through your performance, you should ask yourself, is my performance my God? And I think what Solomon is trying to goad his audience to conclude is what I can achieve is limited. And God is God. What, what I can accomplish is only what other human beings are capable of. And I can't live for those things. 
I must live for God and God alone. He is worthy to be worshiped. That's where we'll conclude it for this session. We'll take a break and come back for a final session this evening.